I, I think I'll start by sort of just trying to put the garden in context a bit. Um, I was asked by the garden committee, there was a, a sort of push on the garden committee. The old garden committee was thrown out, this was in 1980, mm -hmm. because they'd been very inactive. Um, I had published that book, and someone on the new garden committee thought, oh, there's a chap who's done a book on wildflowers, but let's get him in and, and get him to work on the garden. So totally unqualified for this, really, quite you know, totally irrelevant, really. Wildflowers, it isn't a wildflower garden at all. So I was asked to manage and take over basically running and planting the garden, which I did. Um, from the word go, the garden itself had been laid out by Cubitt and he built the whole of Pimlico, but we're, we're now in the oldest and first bit of Pimlico. Exxon Square has the first houses that Cubitt actually built and they're over in the far corner over there, they're a little smaller than this, mm. you'll see there are five or six of them. And they were the very first houses. They were completed in 1832. The Duke of Westminster owned the land, but he gave a lease to Cubitt to develop the whole thing. So it must have been one of the biggest developments there's ever been in Britain, I should imagine. I mean, from here to the river, mm. from Buckingham Palace Road to the, to the river. Um, in the letter, I've seen the actual letter from the Duke to Cubitt, um, the Duke stipulated there must be garden squares within the development because I want to see a little bit of country brought into the town. And it was these great landowners who organised the squares and it was that principle, no doubt they all ate at the same club or drank at the same club or whatever they did. Um, but they introduced this building of garden squares throughout London. We have 450 um, that are nowhere competes at all. I mean, if you wander around New York, there are about two garden squares. There are, that doesn't mean that many wander around Rome. Where are the garden squares? No, mm. there are paved squares with fountains and quite de decorative and so on, but not garden squares. The concept of garden squares is entirely a British one, and we lead the way. So the garden was developed in 1832. Um, I'm pressing the wrong thing. Um, when I took over, as we've said, it was a desert. And the reason for that was the soil had been neglected. And so what I did was I instituted using all the leaf clippings and everything and marching them down mm. and putting it back into the soil. So that shows you a close-up of the leaves rotting and it's absolutely full of worms. This is our compost heap area right now. Mm. And by putting that back into the soil, we're retaining moisture in the soil. So once you plant something, it just takes off. So we don't have any trouble with um, plants doing well. Uh, when I took over, one of the things I was very conscious, it was in 1980, so days were cooler in those times, time, winters were colder. Um, <coughs> one of the things is, of course, you have these big trees and you've got shade everywhere. So that it's basically a shade garden. So I was looking for plants that would succeed in shade. I can hear my voice going to crap up. Mm. Um, camellias do terribly well in shade. And of course flower very early in the year. They're just beginning now. We've got five or six <coughs> fully out. This one, Simplex, which is I think the first camellia actually introduced into Britain. And it's simple because it's a, a, not a complicated flower. It's not actually a wild bloom. It is a mm. cultivated form. 
and they drop as soon as they come into full flower they drop which is marvellous this is now a much more exotic cultivar that's in the far corner of the garden <coughs> yours truly with the veining on the blossoms having planted camellias to combat the shade and deal with the problem of shade then I started thinking about this question of global warming and planting much more tender species because in the centre of town like this of course it is much warmer than out in the countryside um, we've discovered that we can grow echiums uh, I had experimented with echiums back in the 1980s and they all died I also <coughs> I also experimented with them um, that's a very good idea with mimosa ah that's better um, in 86 87 we had very harsh winters mm. and I had a couple of mimosas at that time about two or three years old they're very fast growing so they were probably with a bowl like this um, and they were wiped out in those harsh winters of the late 80s and I did try again until about 1925 or 20, 20, 25, 25 um, and planted them and, and the echiums that you just saw uh, uh, we've got actually four species uh, different species of mimosa um, that, that one, Catamundra wattle is just down the road here. That one's opposite and on the far corner, the traditional mimosa. We've got, one of the things about gardening in a city is you're always looking for things that will do well in the shade. And one of the sorts of plants that does very well is witch hazel, hemimalis. And it flowers so early in the year. It, it, um, this one is now going over. That one's in full flower, and so, so is that one. We've got four or five around the garden. And they're at their best, I suppose, at the end of January normally. And they're wonderfully scented. And this is one of the things about winter flowering plants. They're virtually all wonderfully scented. If you walk around the garden or even around the outside, you'll get wafts of various scents. Sarco cocker, I don't know if any of you know Sarco cocker, tiny little white flowers, but a scent that will travel for 50 or 60 feet. Mm. A fantastic scent. Um, Hamamelis is scented. This is a this this that photograph was taken last week. Um, it's a thing called prunus. I don't know how to pronounce it. It's a Japanese almond, in fact, um, with these very very pretty single pink flowers, strongly and beautifully scented. It's the only prunus that really has a wonderful scent. And again, that was in flower at the beginning of February. It's just starting to go over. <coughs> it's opposite, about number 70 down here on this side of the garden. Uh, winter sweet, um, which is that photograph was taken a couple of days ago, um, is in full flower at the moment. That was. Um, Peter Sackville West, well, she, I think it was one of, you could call it one of her favourite flowers. She wrote a column in the Observer and she did two columns on this. It was, I think, the only plant she did twice, probably a year or two years later. She did it all over again and she describes walking around her garden in the evening, in the dark, because this, this flower is at about Christmas time and very end of December through into early January 
um, and smelling the wonderful scent of this plant. So it's another example. And the theory is that because the light is so low, mm -hmm. that the insects are not attracted by the colour of the, of the plant because there isn't the sunlight to make them so vivid, they're attracted by the scent. So we think it's a, a helpful mechanism for the plants to propagate themselves. Uh, yes, I've just put a couple of drawings amongst them because I didn't have a, a good photo photograph. This is this amazing iris which flowers uh, at Christmas time and is still in flower now. Iris umbricularis, which is really a, more or less a ground cover. It only grows to about this sort of height. This isn't particularly scented, but hellebores, of course, have come before the daffodils and the crocuses. This is hellebores orientalis, um, known as the Easter hellebore. I don't quite know why, um, <coughs> because it's always in flower at this time of year. And it's all over the garden, it self-seeds, so it's naturalised in the garden. We pl I was talking to the gardener earlier today and he said, how many did you put in? And I think I put in about six plants and we've probably got 5,000 now, I should think. Um, I haven't ventured to go anywhere near planting them, but they're wonderful. Then, looking at the sort of planting aspects of the garden, one of the things is, we're actually here in southern England, we're very dry. The rainfall is roughly the same as California. So I looked, the, <coughs> as it were, to California. <coughs> this plant, see, you know, this is known as California London. <coughs> known as California lilac. They're almost always blue, but there are some white. And the whole Californian coast, right from the Baja, right up as far as Washington State, has species of this genus the whole way up. And I started planting them, and they did terribly well. They love it here. They're quite happy in shade. They're evergreen, so they get a good dose of light, whilst the leaves are not on the trees. <coughs> and they thrive in the dry soil that we have with the low rainfall. Um, after we planted quite a few, I, I started experimenting, of course, so at first I planted four or five, and then I saw that they did well, <coughs> and, and added to it. We now have 67 different species or cultivars of the genus Ceanothus, and we're what's called a natural collection. The natural collections are run through Wisley. So we hold the natural collection of, of Cyanothus. This is, I think, probably the strongest of the blue, Puget blue. Puget Sound, of course, is in Washington State, so it's a slightly more northern um, uh, Cyanothus. Joyce Coulter is that sort of more or less opposite this, the Buddhist society. That's a tree form that grows to about seven or eight metres. Um, it, the, the actual wild one is called Cyanothus arborescens, but this is a, a, a cultivar of that, Joyce Coulter. Uh, they were sent over from America to Europe, and the British are responsible for developing them. So most of the hybrids were created in Britain. So you get these names, and the, in Cornwall particularly, you get these names cropping up of the famous uh, Cornish gardens like Troyton Garden in Cornwall. Um, there are, these are evergreen, there's a semi-deciduous form, and that was largely developed in France. So I haven't got any slides of that, but we have got a few plants of it. So they all have French names. <coughs> So, because they were developed in France. So, this isn't the best of photographs, I'm afraid, but the handkerchief tree 
Uh, anybody who's been here in May, early May, mm -hmm. will see our handkerchief tree, which is just um, opposite us, about five houses down, uh, in the centre, and dripping with these. Uh, people think of them as flowers, but in fact they aren't flowers, they're brats. The flowers are the little, rather innocuous lump in the middle of the bract. And the brats are this sort of size, so duly sort of more or less like a tree full of white handkerchiefs. Wonderful tree. From China, it's probably extinct now in China. Mm -hmm. Most of them grew they think there was only about one left before they flooded the Yangtze Valley for the big reservoir. And so if there are any, that's where they would be and they'd be underwater now. Um, but in fact, the Chinese were chopping them down and making charcoal out of them. So they think they probably got rid of the lot before. So, but of June, of course, the English had been planting them. This was introduced by a French botanist, uh, who was actually a, a Christian missionary, as most, most of the early plants people were, and he was working in, in China and discovered this tree and sent it back originally to Paris. Um, I think at that point he only sent dried material and eventually seed was sent back and, uh, and the plant was brought into cultivation. So now we hold quite a lot of them, far more than you would ever find in China. But I'm sipping to another continent. Um, this is a native plant of New Zealand. And up until two years ago, we had a New Zealand gardener in the garden. So he was very keen on bringing in some of the New Zealand plants. This. Um, Kaka Beak is the New Zealandish name for it, and I guess the Kaka was some sort of a strange bird <coughs> in New Zealand, um, probably also extinct. I mean, they had those enormous chickens, didn't they? Mm. That, um, that they ate them all, I think, because there were no predators, there were no cat family or. Uh, in, in New Zealand, so there were no predators to attack the things that, all the things that have gone extinct in the animal population in New Zealand have been caused by man. So, and uh, anyway, I won't go into that. Um, this brings me to roses, and as was mentioned in the introduction, I did a a television series on the history of roses, mm. um, a six-part series, and we started the whole, to, the whole series actually in the garden with some of our roses, and then we ended up going to China and going back in history, obviously, to the excesses of the Romans. Um, that's, that's the plant which is opposite number 15, opposite. And that's a close-up of the flowers. They're quite small, but rather sort of wonderful. Americans refer to it as a boutonniere's rose because it makes an ideal sort of thing for a gentleman's um, jacket. <coughs> um, when looking at the roses in China, there are two forms of roses which repeat flower and it was these roses that were introduced into Europe and mixed with our roses, the European roses, the Damasks and Albers, um, the Gallicas, are all very fine scented roses but didn't repeat flower at all. The repeat flowering comes from the Chinese roses and they're in general rather poorly scented. Um, this one is in the group they refer to as tea roses with rather large, floppy. This is almost a wild plant, Bell of Portugal. Uh, and that's a close up of it. You can see it. Lovely, sort of floppy, elegant petals with just a pink 
touch of pink on the reverse, mm. otherwise white. That isn't for that. That's the Cooper's Burmese rose at the top. I've got a close up of it. Mm. That's an, an enormous tree climbing rose. The, the thing about the part of the reason I put in all these roses is climbing roses are very good in a shady garden because they look for the light so you can grow them up small trees and shrubs and or on harbors or whatever and take them up into the light so we, we actually really specialize in climbing roses um, rather than anything else um, this is a development of the tea rose um, developed by a, a famous French gardener, Navaland. Um He said he had, there were two things he hated in life, the grubs that attacked his roses and us, the British, for finishing off his champion. Um, so he was thinking of, I suppose, of Waterloo. Um, that's a close-up of General Shablokin. Um, it's an amazing tea rose. It's in flower now. Not, it, it has about 25 flowers on it, on the far side of the garden, up a tree. As you can see, this is... But it, it flowers at least three times a year. It just comes back into flower of its own accord. Often it's in flower in December, this year it wasn't. This year it's going to be February. That'll be a very good month from the beginning of um, March. It'll then die right back on. The flowers will cease altogether and it'll flower again, probably in Ju July or something, and then possibly yet again in September. So it, it comes and um, goes. We, there was a close-up, wasn't there? I'm into that. But it, having buildings in a garden is also part of gardening. You know, to sort of say, oh, it's unsuitable in a garden square to have a greenhouse is madness, really. So that's it, I've come to the end. Sorry, I've dribbled on probably too long, haven't I?